Hello, Ian Krauss. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, we are in his office, and he has a poster of a uh, barrack. And uh, Ian, could you tell me so tell us something about this blackboard? Well, this is a very very famous blackboard. <laughs> Many of you may seem like it, feel like it looks familiar, and you have you have good reason. There's a very famous picture of Arnold Schoenberg standing in front of this blackboard with a piece of chalk looking out at the, at the audience. And the reason I have it is because I'm at UCLA and Schoenberg was a teacher here. Uh, this was his last job, I think, before he, he passed away. And uh, this is the blackboard that was in his classroom. Wow. So now it's in my, my studio. Well, uh, hi Ian, thanks for joining us today. Hi Kenny, how are you? Good, I'm good. So, how are you doing? Welcome to my office. <laughs> Okay, so let's start off with what made you decide to be a composer and when did you start composing? Well, I never decided to be a composer, to be honest with you. Okay. In a certain respect, I can never remember not being a composer. There was something about music that exerted a very powerful influence on me. And I remember as a young child, maybe three or four years old, hearing certain pieces of music and they would literally stop me in my tracks. I was spellbound. There was a kind of power that music had over me. And so somewhere in my very early childhood, I started fantasizing about being a composer. And I would compose imaginary symphonies in my head, and I would conduct these imaginary symphonies. Uh, they were probably Beethoven pieces that, that I was thinking I was writing, because I was only four or five at the time. Um, my mom was a musician and a pianist, and so she, was, she would play the piano, I'd hear her play piano, and I would see her music that she would read from, and I was fascinated with, with music, um, the way it looked. And I remember when I was about five years old, I liked art very much too, I liked to draw, I just to very much enjoy drawing uh, with, with charcoal and with pencils and so forth. So I began to copy the symbols of music onto paper in, in random order. I had no idea how to read music, I had no idea what the symbols meant, but I remember feeling a great sense of pleasure in putting musical symbols on the page. And I remember, I remember having the audacity to take it to my mother and ask her, what does this sound like? <laughs> and then, you know, to please me, she would go to the piano and invent something, you know. And uh, so that was my earliest memory of composing. And then a few years later, I became very interested in, in the Beatles and very interested in learning how to play guitar. I was maybe 10 or 11 at the time. And I, I, I kid you not, um, when I learned my first two guitar chords, I wrote a song using those two chords. So I never knew that, I, I just assumed that everybody composed. No, nobody told me that some people are players and some people are composers. So f whenever I had musical instruments, if I went to a friend's house and he had a piano in his basement, I would go to the piano and make things up. So this is well, why I never really decided to become a composer. But um, there definitely came a certain point in time, I would say I was probably maybe 12 or 13, when I began the idea of, of being a composer professionally started to take hold of me. I would say maybe by the time I was yeah, 12, I had decided to, to become a composer. So how would you describe your composition style and um, where do you draw your topics and materials? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I grew up exposed to all kinds of music. My parents loved music and my dad was a math teacher but he, he, was, a, he was a stereo buff and he loved to collect LPs and his musical tastes were very eclectic. He liked big band jazz, he liked folk music, he liked Stravinsky, he liked Bartok. He liked Mussorgsky. Um, he liked many kinds of popular music, and he was playing. Oh, he liked. He loved Debussy. Uh, he loved the French Impressionist school. Very important for me, and also the Russian school. My mom, on the other hand, was a classically trained pianist and a singer, so she loved Mozart and Bach and Beethoven and Chopin. Hmm. So I had these two parents in my uh, growing up. Um, and was exposed to many, many things. So I would say, and then I discovered the Beatles on my own when I was a little kid, and they had a, you know, immense impact on me. So I always loved many different types of music. When I started thinking of myself as a composer, it was Bach that initially inspired me. I mean, my first real inspiration was hearing the Bach fugue and wanting to be able to write music like that, okay, which I taught myself how to do. 
and it grew from there. But I would say from the from the beginning, I was always interested in in polystylism, you know. Um, of course, when I went to school to college in the seventies, actually, uh, yeah, in the seventies, um, the the European avant garde had a kind of dominating position in in schools in the United States, um, and it was sort of the thing where you either did it or you weren't welcome, right? So I embraced that, and I and I discovered Berio and and Stockhausen and and uh, Ligeti and Penderecki and Cage and the American avant-garde composers as well. So I became I sort of steeped myself in that, but I was always actually much more drawn to a slightly older generation of of, of serious composers. You know, I, I I enjoyed Berio, but I loved Britten, and I enjoyed Ligeti and Penderecki, but I loved Stravinsky and Bartok, uh, and Schoenberg, and Berg. So I was always drawn to a somewhat maybe older style of music, even though I was, you know, very much interested in, in the avant-garde. Um, and so literally when I was in college, I tried writing in many, many different styles to see what was the best fit. And I was never satisfied with any of them. Mm. And somewhere along the way, I realized that, to be honest to myself, that whatever music I would write would somehow flow across many, many different styles and traditions. You know, I didn't want to just do one thing. And, um, and, I, and I came to that realization at a, very, at a very young age. I didn't know what to do about it. Um, when I was in college, minimalism, the works of, of, of Steve Reich and Terry Riley and Philip Glass were just starting to become known. And that was a very interesting kind of provocative new, new direction. Um, in music, and there were the people who were experimenting with chants and improvisation and aleatory. That was very interesting. I, I worked with Earl Brown, for example, when I was at USC many, many years ago. Um, so there were these different different ways of doing things, but I think one of the most important experiences I had, this was in the 70s, was hearing George Rockberg's music for the first time. In particular, his string quartet number no. three, which um, I'd never heard anything like that before. Uh, and also, uh, his co-professor at Penn, George Crum, I think Rockberg and Crum, when I first heard their music, I thought, wow, that's much closer to what I could imagine myself doing. Because I heard quotations of Chopin and very interesting avant-garde techniques and new sounds in the works of Crum. And in the works of Rockberg, I heard atonality you know, uh, juxtaposed with, with, with Beethoven-esque tonality. There was something very intriguing about that for me. And I knew that that was more or less the path that I wanted to take. And then I became very interested in, in the music of Steve Reich. And I would say those three composers, Reich, Crum, and, and Rockberg, exerted a particular, they were like beacons for me. I knew I didn't want to do what any of them were doing exactly, you see. but and also Ligeti, I would say, was an important influence as well. Just the rigor of his technique and his counterpoint interested me very much. So I just began to stumble into this idea of, 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 of juxtaposing atonality and tonality. And my first efforts were very primitive. I would have an atonal section and a tonal section. And, they, and I did that for a while. And then after that, 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 I became impatient with that after a while because it, it wasn't quite what I had in mind. I wanted music that flowed across a spectrum. In other words, I, I, I imagined writing music that would start, writing a phrase that would start atonal and very organically become tonal and vice versa. And, and I didn't quite have the technique to do that when I was in my 20s. Hmm. Um, and uh, later I discovered the music of, of Schnitka, who does that very, very well in some of his music. Hmm. Um, and although I respect him very much, I, I decided to reject the way that William Balcom was doing it. I mean, William Balcom would have a 12-tone movement, and then he would have a ragtime movement, and then another 12-tone movement, right? And okay. that, 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 that's great for, 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 for William Balcom, and, and I admire him very much, but I knew that wasn't the path I wanted to take. And I realized that the problem was, with all the composers who were doing it, is that nobody had an original tonal style. What people were doing is they were writing music that sounded like like warmed over Beethoven and then mixing it with the twelve tone idea, or they were writing music that was very derivative of the past and then blending it with, with the present, and that didn't satisfy me. And I realized that to do what I had in mind really, really well, I had to develop my own tonal voice. So I took some time off in my twenties, I stopped writing complicated atonal music, and I devoted myself to tonality. 
not old style tonality, but trying to find, you know, a, a new, if not original voice, certainly a personal voice in tonality. And so that's where Steve Reich, you know, was a, was a, was a beacon for me because he did that. Of course he did, you know. Um, his music is unmistakably his own and it's unmistakably tonal, but in a new way. And yet, I didn't want to copy that. So, it took me, it took me a while. I, it wasn't until I was in my early 30s that I think I really finally found the sweet spot that I was looking for. Um, it was a piece called Tientos for flute and string trio, actually. I know you're a flutist, so you might be interested in that. And um, somehow in that piece, I think I found the right balance and, 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 and was able to do the kind of flow that I always dreamed of. So that was in my, in my early 30s, and now I'm almost 60. So for the past 28 years, I've been exploring that path. And, and, it, does, and it seems like an, an, a never-ending one. Where and when do you get inspired the most? But Let me kind of back into that question by just saying that um, I prefer to compose after I've had a good night's sleep. Okay. I like to sleep deeply and well and wake up in the morning fresh and not distracted by the cares of the day before I read the newspaper, before I answer emails, even before I eat sometimes, I want to go straight to composing. Wow. Um, I find that, my, I find that it's, it's very effortless when I do that. Whereas some, some composers like to compose at night. Yeah. I'm not a night composer at all. I like to sleep at night. And I, and I don't tend to trust myself when I'm sleepy. I, I tend to be skeptical of the quality of what I'm doing. I guess you'd call, call me a binge composer. <laughs> you know, I get, a, I get a project, and then I put everything else aside, and I work on the project, and then when it's finished, you know, I move on to other, other things. Um, at least that's how it's been the last, the last ten years or so. I'm not composing right now, for example, but I've, I'm sort of positioning myself to, to do the next series of projects. And what I think has inspired me the most for many, many years is other music particular pieces or styles of music that really captivate me for some reason. I, I want somehow to relate my music to that or even capture some of it and use in my music. For example, um, this year I have two, two commissions I'm doing. One is for two Persian instruments, percussion instrument and tar, and classical guitar. As you probably know, I, I, I've worked, I was a guitarist myself and many of my commissions are for classical guitar pieces. Well, this is a new, a new, uh, a new direction for me. Uh, somehow interacting with with traditional Persian music, um, and then mixing that with the Western idiom of the, of the classical guitar. So, in preparation for a piece like that, I listen to a lot of Persian music. I listen to the instruments. I try to internalize them emotionally so that I can just do it spontaneously. And I have another project that's actually coming up even sooner than that. Very similar one. I've been commissioned by. Um, a guitar quartet uh, from Greece uh, called the Miscellanea Guitar Quartet. They're an amazing group in Europe and they've been playing my, my pieces for years. They're commissioning me to write a new, new guitar quartet. And so since they're from Greece, in particular Crete, I thought this might be interesting for me to kind of get to know the music from Greece, which I've never really studied much before, and do something with Greek music. So I often like to work with with a world music style, folk tradition of some sort, um, and then bring it into my own my own language, my own sound world, and create something that's completely different than anyone's ever heard before. I see. That's 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 always my goal. I see. Um, when I was a kid, somehow I bought into the whole Beethovenian notion of, of original art, even though it's a real pain in the rear sometimes. You know, it's 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 hard to always be doing something which is which is original. It's not easy. And sometimes, you know, as a composer, you say, today I'm just going to, you know, relax and have fun and just write a piece just for fun. And I'm not worried about how original it is or anything like that. But um, I, do, I do seek that. And so I've often found that when I, when I, when I look at a uh, foreign element, something that's new to me, and then, and then learn about it and bring it into my own sound world, it, it, I find something new that I've never done before. So I'd say every piece that I write, I want to try something new. Um, go somewhere I've never gone before, some new technique, new sounds that I've never, I've never done before. I, I always feel strange if I do something similar to what I've already done. You know, it feels like it, it's not going to be as good, and so I tend to resist that and always have something I've never done before.
The audience has a wide range of music training and appreciation, and some, some people find classical music daunting, some contemporary classical music even more daunting. So do you ever feel the need to address uh, different interests? And uh, um, was there ever a situation where you have to uh, sacrifice your artistic taste for accessibility? Um, I'm not willing to do that, okay. personally. I, I, I just, um, I accept the fact that no matter what I do, I'm not going to be beloved by everyone. Okay. No matter what I do, okay. right? Even if I write a very accessible piece of music, some people will hate it because it's too accessible. <laughs> and if yeah. I write a piece that's completely inaccessible, many will hate it, but some will love it because it's To me, I, I'm not interested in that. Um, I, I, and this is why I've always been very interested in the, the great composers of the classical canon, because I think all of them, all of the, all of the composers that we revere today, from, from, from Palestrina to Monteverdi to Bach and Handel, Mozart, Debussy, Stravinsky, all of these composers, they were able to write music that was accessible, that spoke to many, many people, but to do so with the highest rigor of their, of their epics. And to me, that's, that's the, the, the goal that I try to, to seek in my own music, to write music that is accessible and also rigorous at the same time. And that's not easy to do. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I've, I've devoted my life to that, and I think I've succeeded a few times, at least, in doing that. <laughs> in a world of pop music, uh, the listeners are always looking for something new. But in classical music, it's really interesting that a lot of the classical listeners want to hear the familiar. They want to, they want to listen to a lot of dead composers' works. So, how do you think we can change this climate? How do we, how can we get the classical music audience to be interested in living composers' music? Well, you know, it's funny you mention that because um, um, I love, I like popular music myself, and most most popular music is terrible and it's completely forgettable. But when you hear a really good piece of popular music, it's it's you know worthwhile. It's something you've listened to and and you come back to again and again and again. But I haven't discovered the same thing. That I, I, I can't say I agree with you about what you said about popular music. But what I hear is it's the same thing over and over and over again, and it's not a whole lot of innovation. So to me, it almost tells me that people kind of want to keep hearing the same. I think people are naturally um, say, feel safer with what they already know. I don't, I don't care if I don't, I don't think it matters whether it's popular music or jazz music or, or, or classical music. And yet, um, you're right. I think we all, as human beings, we do crave we do crave something that's that's new, but not something that's merely new, which is easy to do. It's really easy. It doesn't take any skill, particularly or creative, just to be new. That's not difficult. But to be new and wonderful, that's not easy to do. And I think we crave it in popular music. You know. Um, when the Beatles came along, for example, suddenly they demonstrated a whole new wonderful way of making popular music that others had not discovered before. Um, and many other, you know, or David Bowie, who just passed away, was another artist like that, a visionary popular artist. And the same thing is true in classical music. Um, most classical, most new classical music, if we're honest about it, is not very good either. You know, it just isn't. Um, it may have, you know, um, I'm just speaking in very general terms now, of course, but um, you know, maybe certain, maybe some pieces that are flawed have great moments in them, right? But the pieces themselves are not universally at a high level. I think if we're honest about it, most of the work that we do um, is not great masterpieces, right? But um, still, we should strive for that. I mean, because every now and then, a visionary artist like Steve Reich comes along and says, wait a minute, here's a whole new wonderful world that you haven't thought about, and we go, and, and then you know, we enjoy it. So I think the, it's up to us as composers. We're the ones that have the responsibility for producing good work, right? And I think if we do, the audience will always be there for that. Right? Nice. Would you like to give uh, some advice to you know, fresh graduates from college or graduate school? And it, like, if you were to go back in time, and advise yourself, you know, could you, what would you have to say to yourself? Well, this is going to sound very narcissistic because I, if I could go back in time, I would do exactly the same thing I did when I was a young person. And that's the advice I'm going to give to, to um, people who see this. Um, there's a lot of noise in the world. 
right? We're bombarded with it. And, and composers, I think in particular, have to learn to shut a lot of it out. You know, we have noise from critics, from teachers, from people who say music should be this, music should be that, don't do this, do this. If you don't do this, you're no good, blah, blah, blah. All this noise. And, you know, we, especially young composers might be very tempted to, to fall into that, listen to it. Oh, so-and-so has won this competition, or oh, I need to go win that competition, or, or so-and-so has a, you know, an orchestra piece you know, done by the, the Louisville Symphony. Oh, I better go and do that, right? So we're always sort of chasing um, what other people are doing and focusing on what others are doing in a kind of calculated way. I see this a lot in, 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 in young people, young composers, and then I'm sure the same was true when I was young as well. I'm still young, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, 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 would, so I would tell young composers, you know, don't worry so much about what other people are doing or, or that you haven't achieved some milestone at the same age that they did. Put, that's noise to me. Put it out of your head and just focus on who you are as a unique individual. Focus on, 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 the, on the values that you love in music, the music that you love, the composers that you love. Focus on, on the kinds of attributes that you want your music to have. And don't worry so much about this ism or that ism or spectralism or minimalism or post minimalism or all these stupid, you know, isms that come along, which by the way, by the time they're named, are already old fashioned. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's good. That's good advice. You know? And 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 uh, so, you know, if you're always chasing what the ism, you're always gonna be you're always gonna be behind. You're not gonna see succeed in your own goal. But if you forget about that stuff and just try to find your own music. Even if it's not something that's in that's in that's fashionable, right? You may not have success right away. You may never have success. That's a risk that you take. You may never. There's no guarantee that you're going to have success, but I think you're much more likely to have success if you if you do what I'm saying. Um, focus on who you are, not how you can be like somebody else. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ian Charles. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs>